Oh, hello, Michelle. Um, thanks very much for having me um, present uh, here today. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to say uh, that um, I, I acknowledge my own old ancestors, the Yugambe people, the Kumbamari people of the Yugambe language uh, nation here on the Gold Coast. Um, and this looks like a, a really, really interesting uh, um, theme um, and subject for sort of talking about and discussing. Uh, how can we build a, an, inspire, a, an inspiring earth ethics? Um, how do we start with uh, Aboriginal people? Um, you know, people who are probably used to um, or are familiar with uh, some of the uh, news items that have come out recently talking about how, how old the culture is, uh, oldest, you know, continuous civilization in the world and, and so on. Um, and the things that uh, we've learnt about, about the land, but about, especially about human society. Uh, about ourselves in this country uh, after all this long period of time. And I guess uh, one way of starting off is um, one thing that Aboriginal people had to try and work out is how do, you, how do we live together without doing each other in? How do we do that? And how do we live together without damaging the environment? Uh, too much or at all preferably and then above all um, uh, Selecting or working out a system of a philosophy or a, a way of life a way of thinking uh, about life uh, that doesn't uh, make people feel um, uh, lonely um, murderous or alienated from each other um, because people have tried to find either comfort or understanding, but quite often, uh, many cultures, I mean, um, in different ways, but quite often they've, the, the paths that they have uh, gone along have been either ended up being quite destructive or um, essentially made people feel uh, not included um or any any kind of a, a very varying range of um un, uh, not clear ways of relating to each other and especially that the re a relationless ethos um so people want peace they search for wisdom uh and uh, basically a, a good life or happiness love all, all that sort of thing but for Aboriginal people, I guess they found they found a, what can be called a sort of a golden mean. Uh, what what is called that? Uh, and I don't mean it's like the answer to all of life or anything like that. But they they found that the, the best way to start is with the relationship with land itself. So the the original kind of old idea is that. Land has invented us, it's thrown us up, it's, it created us. Um, so therefore, we are always going to be um, obliged to, to it for giving us essentially um, life, but not just life, but our existence, the whole of our existence and all meaning that underpins and um, uh, you know, uh, surrounds that lives through us so so the idea to start off with is the the growth or the birth if you like coming from land inventing us and giving us life uh, all the for example all the um the different life forms that happened before you know uh, mega mega uh, fauna um uh, all the flora and fauna, insects, everything, every living thing you can think of, um, they're all 
our ancestors because they all came before us. They're the, they're the ancestors of human beings, basically. So, so in turn, all of those things, um, besides, you know, the, literally the grass we walk on or the soil we walk on, food we eat and so on, all of those things help us to be, be, helped us to become human and to stay human, to, to develop as further as a human being, uh, but also, above all, to um, create culture, actually. So um, we became human beings, and culture gave us personhood, really, too. Uh, so it gave us meaning in life and identity. Uh, and those two things especially, they, they um, came about through uh, this relationship with land. So there are two kinds of relations, um, essentially. The relationship between land and people, and then the relationship between people. And the relationship between people is always contingent on the relationship between land and people. So for Aboriginal people, we worked out that you have this uh, a custodial ethic, uh, the, uh, a, a relationalist ethos with land, where because we're always um, obliged to it, um, we're always like thankful. Uh, we're, so therefore, we're obliged to look after it. So it's a great reciprocal relationship and. If it could be described as this, it's it, in a way, it's like the law of relations, or as Irene Watson, Professor Irene Watson says, it's the law of reciprocity that's uh, come out of this relationship between humans and land in this country. And it is. So um, it looks after us, we look after it, it looks after us, we look after it. And every, uh, right across the country, north, south, east, and west, uh, all the different groups. They all have their own particular relationship with their particular part of the, the land or the locality. So locality is all, it really is all. Um, and because the locality is the land itself, the shape, the form of it, um, salt water, fresh water, mountains, plains, uh, they, it, every part of the land has its own character. But that character has uh, come into the people who lived there for a very long time. So, uh, so that's why the story, the creative, um, the great creative narrative of every story um, has, uh, it, it's different from place to place. Uh, the ones that are next door to each other, they, they have, they hold things uh, in, um, uh, they're familiar things, they um, they might uh, have a joy, joining up, joined up, uh, stories, the creative narratives, for example, like big red kangaroos, they're in one particular part, and the next door neighbours also have them, but the further you go away from that particular region, there, there are fewer and fewer. So the character, the character of the land, is, 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 it's the basis of the character of the people, uh, and, and not just in, um, in this uh, relationalist ethos way, but in the actual character of the people. So and I think this is the same all over the world. Yeah? Um, people, people who live on plains, they have certain characteristics that are not present in people who live in, say, for example, valleys or high, um, high mountainous ranges or something like that, or, or, or for example, uh, I don't know, um, uh, um, la a lake district or lots of rivers and, and so on and so on. Um, so it actually shapes our very, not just our uh, identity, but it shapes our psychology, our very being and so on. So the very, one of the very first steps of our building and inspiring some kind of an ethic with, uh, that, that is based on the earth itself is to try to see land not only as a backdrop, not only as like backdrop like wallpaper or... Um, property or real estate or something, to, to try to um, have a deeper feelings for it, and not just for the beautiful view either, but uh, every part of it. For example, um, I've always thought that, uh, well traditionally, um, uh, Aboriginal people growing up when they're very young, they're, lear they're learning all the time 
about um, the, 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 their own land. Not only the stories, but every part of it, like um, the kind of soil there is, the grasses, the, um, uh, almost, almost like scientific understanding of that, the land itself. What kind of birds inhabit the place? What kind of insects inhabit the place? Flora and fauna of all sorts, of course. Uh, but you, you get very, very close to it. No, not only just understanding it, but looking after it. Understanding that you make up stories about it. Um, this is white follows. I mean, the idea, of course, is, isn't uh, that white follows only learn all the stories of the Aboriginal people because it's, you know, it's, a, it's kind of, uh, it's a bit of, uh, uh, well, it's, it's not right, really, culturally, in a way. The, the stories belong to the particular people, but, but people in different parts of the country, uh, out in the country, in the city areas, in urban areas, regional areas, um, and especially school kids, they could learn, learn really closely uh, about everything about their own area. So they don't necessarily have to learn the whole scientific story of the, all the land, the whole land. But, I mean, they'd learn that anyway, I suppose, in school. But um, so you're building not just knowledge, you're building a custodial ethic of looking after. So, uh, for example, it's the idea of empathy. Um, uh, which is all part of the law of um, the law of reciprocity, of understanding the other. Um, for example, um, Aboriginal people may not have known the science of this, but apparently, it, uh, empathy is a chemical in the brain, and you have to literally act as your care, act out caring for the other, but especially like land caring for the land, caring for, uh, for the other, that the actions, the actual actions, build, build more of that empathy, that chemical. The chemical is strengthened, it grows and so on. And when people don't um, exercise that, um, then that, that empathy goes down. The, the, the chemical itself slowly sort of dissipates and, and so on. So it's got to be far more than simply, well, it's a great idea, you know, um, to, to look after the land. It's a great idea, you know, we'll be saved and so on. Or it can't be just a great high ideal, as in um, almost a religious idea, like, uh, you know, you don't, don't worship nature, you just simply look after it. But you look after it in action. Okay? And that builds empathy. And when that builds empathy, um, that, that actually becomes like a template for the rest of the society. So you're building empathy, and so people actually become more empathetic with each other. Now, old Aboriginal people didn't might not have known the science of it, but they certainly knew the truth, the truth of that sort of living or that sort of life. They knew it, uh, and so you that that was that had to be the law, the law of relations. Look after land, look after kin, look after the country, look after relatives, the kin. Um, so you might not, you know, the, the idea of not getting on with relatives or having traditional enemies or something that, that of course, has always kind of existed. But the, the really important thing is, is the idea that you look out for, you're obliged to look out for the other, the family relations, um, your neighbours, especially the neighbours, uh, and especially your, um, uh, the land itself. So um, don't exploit it, don't be cruel to it. Um, if you have to utilise um, any part of it, you're, you'll quite often, I mean, the, old, the old way is to actually call whatever it was, you know, brother or sister, um, you know, uh, killing an animal. Uh, I, suppose, I suppose a lot of white people would um, recognise it as being kosher, but Aboriginal style being kosher. <laughs> so you, you have to be kind and uh, understanding and, uh, if you've got to kill something, whether it's a you know, flora or fauna or tree or anything at all. Um, but not to an extreme sense in that way. So a relationalist, a relationalist ethos is really like uh, th there are four um, essential attributes, if you like, and that is ethics is number one, ethics. Uh, some kind of an ethics because 
the, the thinking is, um, uh, and, uh, as you say, earth ethics, but we, we would say, I suppose, uh, you know, custodial ethics, because it, it addresses everything, the earth and people, of course. It's got to, so it's, it's got to be a, a broad, deep sort of approach to, to, to ethics. Um, so the thinking behind our relationalist ethos, I suppose, is that in a way you can't learn ethics in an artificial way, like purely from an idea, purely from an idea or from a great teacher. You can, I mean, a great teacher is very valuable, but, but uh, and you may, you may very well learn ethics from that great teacher or the, the writings or the sayings of the great teacher, um, but it's not going to last. It, it probably won't last. It may last with you, but it won't last with the next people or, or the next generation. Um, it's too unsteady. So don't, don't look for ethics in any kind of idea or ideal, like love, uh, you know, loving all humanity or something like that. Um, because again, uh, that will be tested, tested really badly, uh, you know, in conflict and, and so on and so on. How do you work out all the contradictions that there are to do with that? So ethics only comes from looking after something outside of ourselves first, that is, that is land. And then gradually, as that becomes almost like a habit, um, it, it, people learn. Um, and the, essentially, this is what sort of really, um, in a way, happened, I suppose, is that that looking after uh, becomes the habit that is taken up with looking after um, your your own people, looking after people, looking after humans, uh, you know, not um, arguing, fighting, and so on, um, even though that takes place, but it's not turned into permanent warfare, not turned into permanent warfare. And the permanent warfare, in my understanding, is the idea of taking over someone else's land. So you can have traditional enemies for sure, but the idea of taking over someone else's land is absolutely um, has absolutely got to be against any kind of earth ethics, human ethics, and so on. So the idea of someone invading someone else's country uh, was was totally unheard of. It was just completely unheard of. It's not even in um, um, creative narratives. There there are fights. There are certainly you know uh, conflicts, but not that. So ethics is a the big one of, of the uh, of the attributes uh, place uh, place itself with a capital P so the locality itself place gives you identity gives you personhood um, and that that is extremely important I mean the very the, the idea of someone being a citizen of the world or um, a, a wanderer of some sort with no home or anything like that I'm not not talking only about like homeless people or stateless people or things like that. Somewhere there has to be some kind of a, a, a place. And again, as I said, not a place with, um, you know, uh, not necessarily a place with a wonderful view and all that kind of stuff, but, but place itself because it's so utterly tied up with identity. The other one is um, autonomy. So, uh, it's a way of, and this is tied up with locality, of course, and place. So um, every every different group, every just imagine every different area is an autonomous area. If you, if people could somehow work on that kind of um, approach of, of of autonomy, and of course, when we're talking about autonomy, we're talking about politics, I suppose. So not just the politics of um, human relations, but of social relations, of community relations, communities, and so on. So, for example, the argument is it goes something like my 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 mob, my community, is an autonomous one. Um, the one next door is autonomous also, and our autonomy must not transgress the other one's autonomy. And yet somehow you have to be able to not only have conflict uh, if, it, if it arises, but handle it very well at the same time as, you know, um, holding in, uh, in, in a good ethical way each other's uh, autonomy. So I'm an autonomous being, a person, 
all women are women are autonomous beings, not to be enslaved or you know um, owned uh, or anything like that, or on a lower rung of the ladder or anything. Um, so uh, and that leads us to the fourth one. So that's autonomy, that's ethics, place, autonomy. And the fourth one, it, it fits very well into autonomy, and that is balance. So always seeking the balance in everything. Um, balance, for example, uh, the most obvious one for us is uh, a gender ba balance, men and women, men's law, women's law. So th th these might sound like really old, old ways of doing things and they are but they they do and they can have modern application though too um, so for example a board meeting so a board or committee or something um, or even a parliament for, for example <laughs> um, uh, having equal equal numbers or balanced numbers I should say of, um, of uh, men and women um, men and women run run should run the earth together as a partnership and in an obvious political way very political way so relationalism or the relational the relationalist ethos you try in those sorts of ways to grow those things you 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 grow ethics you grow that attachment to place uh, and your personhood through it you know identity you grow autonomy. You, 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 they have to be grown things. It's sort of a bit like a construction job that has to happen. So it's it's just think of it like that. Literally, how, you know, how can we build, construct, and inspiring earth ethics? That's how you do. So you 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 really do have to, I think, change society itself. Not just so so much going simply going out and being good gardeners and. Um, more healthy gardeners, gardening, and I don't know proper, uh, you know, ways of looking after specifically the land. I mean, those things should go on anyway, and they are. They have to be. So, you know, you do that. Um, but the idea of looking after one another, you know, looking after land and looking after one another. So I know it sounds. It mightn't sound ha have anything to do with anything, <laughs> but I do believe that it's the earth ethics also means being openly and quite clearly uh, anti-war, anti-war. I, I wouldn't be so anti um, any particular other thing, but that idea of whole societies making war or provoking war uh, against other countries, because they happen to disagree with them, um, come out openly to be against those sorts of things, because that's, at the moment, in this, in this, in the world, that's what's going on at the moment in all different areas of the world, different countries and so on. And of course, the, 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 the um, equal, equal kind of great concern is of course climate change coming, happening. Um, I would, um, I don't know, uh, um, really come out very strong. I know people do, and the Greens do of course, you know, um, but I, I, I really do believe that People don't, that they're not organized enough to do this. They're not organized enough and they're not hard enough about it. They have to come be much more obvious and aware um, to, to, to work like this um, uh, for looking after, um, like the protests against Adani. Um, that's fantastic. Um, but uh, for, for my own, uh, for my own uh, idea was that. Uh, there should have been more uh, more protests actually <laughs> even more more hard hard protests against that kind of thing hard protests against um cruelty as a policy of the australian government against aboriginal people and against the uh, asylum seekers and mary um on that note we might unfortunately have to wrap up although <laughs> we could listen to you all day i know i certainly could um <laughs> So to wrap up, was there anything else, just as a final remark, or? Uh, no, not really. Um, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary Graham. And um, we're so um, honoured and pleased that you could join us, uh, even though you're not here in person. But we look forward to having you join us in person, perhaps at our next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.